scrum, uh, Kanban, we know uh, sprints, part of scrum. And um, this book that Teresa has put together basically is, uh, it's the end to end of modern product delivery, the discovery approach. So I'm not gonna waffle on any more about what it is exactly, because this is what we uh, want Teresa to talk with us about. So Teresa, can I ask you to unmute yourself and join us? Uh, and Priyanka is hosting on behalf of Prakash today. So Priyanka, you're very welcome. Um, and Priyanka, I don't know if you have the tool to put uh, Teresa and myself as the main view. Thank you. Okay, that's super. And Teresa, can you unmute yourself and join us? Yeah, hello, I'm excited to be here. Hello, Teresa, it's fantastic to have you with us. Uh, and I was cobbling together my introduction there for you, Teresa. And I'm happy to be the first to admit that this is not an area that I'm familiar with. Um, I am trained in Scrum, I don't mind saying. Uh, I'm familiar with Sprints and Kanban. Uh, but in terms of the, what you call the product trio, uh, the people to whom you think this book is directly aimed. Uh, tell us a little bit more, what exactly is continuous product discovery? Yeah, so that's really gonna get into the heart of my talk. Um, it really is just the work that product teams are doing to make good decisions about what to build. And so historically, uh, a lot of these decisions have happened top down, right? Executives have kind of come up with a strategy. They've tried to predict the future. They've tried to say, this is what we think we should be building. And a lot of organizations are starting to recognize that that just doesn't work. And so they're pushing decision-making power down to their individual teams and letting, and then that's led to this evolution of how do we rapidly um, try and iterate, right? Try a bunch of different things, see what works, iterate from there. Um, and so it's led to a new adoption of practices that in the industry we refer to as discovery. And yeah, as you say, the, the top down, certainly many people would say isn't working. And I think a lot of companies as well have uh, realized, particularly in this period with people working from home and systems almost being broken, but in a natural way, they've realized that other ways of working are possible and other, other power sharing uh, approaches have been more successful than they would have anticipated. And this, as you say, this differing approach to uh, discovery is something that's sort of key to where you're coming from, isn't it, Teresa? Yeah, definitely. It really helps. I mean, we in the sort of organizational behavior literature, there's a lot of conversation about learning organizations and how do we create learning organizations. And I think that's really at the heart of discovery in the, in the product world, is how do we get our product teams learning as much as possible about what customers need, what's working for them, what's not working for them, so that we're always um, continuously improving. Something that interested me when I was reading about your book, Teresa, was that you said that there are questions you need to ask at the outset. What are we to build to the degree where sometimes, uh, uh, be it with the stages of an app or whatever, is that we're building, but we're actually building the wrong stuff without knowing because we're not asking the right questions. Tell us a bit more about that, Teresa. Yeah, I'm sure everybody on this call has experienced this. If you pick up your phone, you probably have dozens of apps that you were at one point really excited about. And then over time, maybe immediately, it didn't quite work for you. It didn't match your mental model. Um, so it was missing a critical feature. Uh, it didn't really engage you over time. We see this a lot with software. Software is pretty complex. Um, it's easy to fall into the myth of all it takes is to have a good idea um, and really, uh, there's a lot of work and a lot of little details that need to be right in order for it to be usable by someone, not just usable, but also valuable, and then also valuable for the customer and then also valuable for the business um, so that's sustainable over time. 
And is it as simple as not engaging with the customer that creates these? Because as you say, you'll download an app or, or you'll be using a website or something of this format. And for the uninitiated straight away, you're saying to yourself, oh God, if only it had this, or why is it I have to do this, these three stages and I want to just jump to this and where is what I'm looking for and things that seem simple to the uninitiated. You just start. Yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons why that can happen. Sometimes it's because that product team is not spending enough time with customers and there really is a gap between how they think about the product and how somebody who doesn't work on the product might think about the product. Sometimes that happens because you're not the target customer, right? The product was designed for a different use case or a different segment. And it's just a little bit of a mismatch. So it could be a great product. It's just not a great product for you. Um, and so oftentimes when you're using a product, if it's not working for you, you have to take a step back and say, well, was this designed for me? And if it wasn't, is there somebody else that is um, designing for me that if I go find that product, it would be a better fit? But we do see we're at a stage in the industry with digital products. I mean, we're 30 years into proper internet products and um, not much longer than that for complex software products. And we're still learning. We're still learning. Um, we're still learning to appreciate the complexity of digital products. I think that's really the core of it is that we, we started out um, thinking that software was like um, building the same types of widgets we build in manufacturing, that we could just write a spec um, and that we're gonna produce the same thing and that out the other end is gonna get exactly what we asked for. And unfortunately the complex world or the, soft, the software world is far more complex than that. There's a lot more moving parts um, and there's a lot more different disciplines that need to be involved. And uh, it involves a lot more ongoing human interaction. And I'm sure as a behavioral science group, you all understand the complexity that adds. Um, and so it's just, it's a whole different beast. And I think that uh, as a technology industry, we've been a little bit slow to acknowledge that it's a completely different beast. And then um, even as we have acknowledged it, we're uh, kind of swimming upstream against business culture, right? Traditional business culture is very top down. Um, it's very uh, forecast five years into the future. And we're seeing that with complex systems, you can't forecast five years into the future. You have to be more adaptive. You have to be more reactive. You have to be more experimental. And I think that's hard for a lot of companies to really accept. And so we're seeing a very slow adoption and change. And as a result, we see a large percentage of products just not work that well for humans. Um, but we are starting to see change. And especially in the, in the internet world over the last 15 years, we've seen quite a bit of change. And that's um, pretty exciting to see because we're getting much better products. I love that you uh, acknowledge there, Teresa, the basic fact that I think that a lot of us are almost sort of in denial about that, of course, it is such new technology. And in a way, we've all adapted so rapidly to a completely different way of working. But as you say, whilst the technology has come along with us and we've all adopted to it, our structure and thinking in our way of working hasn't quite hasn't quite caught up with it and of course this is exactly what you're doing what is it about your particular approach that makes so many teams say that after having been coached by you or after having read your book that it makes such a incremental change in their approach yeah, so there's three primary components. When we're talking about continuous discovery, it's all about the decisions that we're making about what to build, right? And historically, that was made by senior leadership. It's now being pushed to these cross-functional teams. So it's a team of a product manager, designer, a software engineer. Sometimes there's other roles. And it's really looking at how do we get them collaborating from the beginning? And that collaboration piece is big. It sounds trivial. We all give lip service to collaboration, but we rarely truly do it. And the reason why it's so critical is that what we used to do was we would have a product manager write requirements, hand it off to designers who would do the design work, and then everything would get handed off to the engineers. And the challenge with that is that we saw a lot of rework, right? The designers would try to design something, they'd run into a constraint, requirements would have to get redone. We'd see the same thing on the engineering side. Everything would eventually get to the engineers, 
it would take seven times as long to build as we thought. We'd then want to change the scope to get it under back on schedule. Um, we see this a lot in the public sector. So if you see governments trying to build software, it almost always goes astray. And it's because they're still working under this old waterfall. Um, we're going to define all the requirements up front. And then um, the teams that are implementing it get into the complexity and they realize they couldn't have forecasted what they ran into. And we got to start over. We got to revise. And in the public se sector, especially, we don't learn from our mistakes, right? We, when we revise, we revise in the same try to predict the future, spec everything out kind of way. And we end up wasting a ton of money and we end up with solutions that just don't work. So the first piece is getting those people collaborating from the very beginning. So you reduce all that rework. The second piece is really getting them, that team that's building the product to engage with customers on a regular basis. So making sure that they are, and there's two parts to that, making sure that they're understanding for the people that they're designing for, what are the biggest pain points? What are the biggest needs? What problems are they solving? And making sure that team is hearing that firsthand so that nothing is lost in translation. And then there's a second part to this, which is as you start to explore solutions, um, how are you breaking your ideas into underlying assumptions and then rapidly testing those assumptions so that you're collecting um, good data about what might work and what might not work. And that's really um, new for a lot of product teams. They're not trained as scientists. Um, a lot of them maybe aren't even trained very well in the scientific method. And there's sort of this mindset of, it's not about having the right answer, it's about getting to the right answer. Um, and again, that's a little counter, counter to a lot of business culture. In business, we get rewarded for being right. Um, and we don't get rewarded for trying a lot of things and figuring out they won't work. But in the product world, we're recognizing that is what it takes to, to build good products. And you talk in the book about mindsets. That's yeah. very important, Teresa, yes. Do you want to elaborate yes. a little bit more about that? Yeah, we'll see if I can enumerate all the ones in the book off the top of my, <laughs> off the top of my head. Um, it is Saturday morning for me, so we'll see. Um, so uh, one, one, the first one is really this collaborative piece, right? Avoiding these handoffs, really working as a team, um, taking advantage of all the unique perspectives on your team, making sure you're leveraging all the expertise on your, pay, on your team. Um, another one is truly being customer centric. So this is an area where a lot of businesses give lip service to this, but we don't do it in practice. Um, and this is really putting the customer at the center of your universe and really starting with how do I create value with my customer um, for my customer in a way that's going to create value for my business. So it's sustainable over time. Um, another one is that experimental one. And this is a tough one for a lot of teams to get the balance right, because some people swing the pendulum too far and they want to they want to run um, large scale quantitative um, double blind controlled studies and we just don't have time for that in the product world and nor do we need to because one of the major advantages we have in the product world is we have really strong feedback loops we actually get to see what humans do when they interact with our products and so it's really learning how to adapt these really rigorous academic research methods into a more flexible and fluid and much quicker way while keeping the reliability of those methods. Um, and that's a lot of the fun for me is looking at how do we train non-scientists to think like scientists um, and give them methods that'll work in this really fast paced world, um, but maintaining a lot of that rigor and making sure that we're overcoming cognitive biases and we're reducing noise and we're reducing error overall so that we increase the likelihood that we're building the right things. And um, that's fascinating, Teresa. Um, you mentioned yourself earlier on about the role that behavioral science plays in this. And of course, you've just said that you are seeing very quickly the human interaction. But yeah. to what degree do you think that the uh, product developers are aware of, familiar, using behavioral science? You know, how, how, how often do you come across it in your field of work, acknowledging sort of awareness of it? I think Teresa's frozen there. You will rejoin us quickly, I hope, Teresa. Yeah, she's most definitely frozen, yes. Oh, well, in the interim, whilst we wait for Teresa to unfreeze, <laughs> Kathleen doing a good uh, little impression there, whilst we wait for her to unfreeze, we'll go across to the 
uh, chat box from all of our members who've joined us today. And I didn't properly thank all of you for joining us today. So hello, everybody. And if you're new to Behavioral Science Club, you are extremely welcome. And as I always say, it's lovely to see so many of our regular members uh, joining us, uh, our loyal, loyal followers. And as you can see, we have Priyanka here today, who's anchoring for Prakash. Mm -hmm. uh, you're quite uh, familiar with talking with us in the group anyway, Priyanka, with your always very lively questions. Mm -hmm. But how are you feeling about co-hosting today? Lord choose to feel a little nervous. I think uh, Teresa is back with us. I'm just gonna, Teresa, are you here? She did yes. just. Sorry yeah. about that. That's all I'm right, back. Teresa, <laughs> you're welcome back. Yeah, so we were touching on the use and awareness of behavioral science that you come across when you're dealing with teens. Yeah, so I, rely, I draw quite a bit from um, behavioral science. It's not something that most of the teams that I work with have a deep expertise in. So it's less about teaching them about behavioral science. It's more about um, designing systems and processes that help them um, overcome a lot of the sort of biases that come up in decision making. Or um, a big one that comes up a lot in organizations is around this um, idea of procedural justice and like creating fairness around who gets to make decisions. Um, because there's this balance between uh, leaders who still kind of want to dictate solutions and product teams who really want to um, have, a, a, have an authority and autonomy and be empowered to go build the best thing for their customers. And it sounds, um, there's, there's not one right answer. It's really a mix of both. And how do you navigate that? And how do you negotiate that? So a lot of what organizations have to do is um, define the rules in which that's going to happen so everybody feels like it's fair. And then um, on the team itself, there's a lot that comes up around um, product teams do a lot of interviewing and they got to make sure they're not falling prey to confirmation bias as they interview. Um, all humans tend to fall in love with their own ideas. So we see escalation of commitment come up quite a bit in the product world. Um, we definitely see uh, all sorts of um, just judgment errors. So um, and especially a lot of people do, um, are learning how to be data informed, but not just be, not just follow the data exactly because we are dealing with messy, complex situations um, with lots of different inputs. Um, a lot of people in the product world talk about how this understand, like the phrase, um, the map is not the territory ends up being thrown a lot, around a lot, right? This idea of like, you may have modeled this, but the model is not reality. It's just showing you one slice of it. Um, so. It is, behavioral science is a big topic in the product world. I find that the understanding of it is really surface level. So I'll give you an example. Confirmation bias is a great example of this. A lot of teams interpret confirmation bias to mean they're ignoring negative feedback about their ideas. And they don't fully understand that they're actually not even seeing the negative feedback, that their brain is acting as a filter. And so that's one of the roles that I play is that like, look, none of us want, I mean, Kahneman said this himself, none of us want to believe that we fall, that we're susceptible to cognitive biases and even knowing about them doesn't help us overcome them, right? And so um, there's a few things that I do to help teams with that. One is on the collaborative piece, I teach them to surface all the individual perspectives before they start coming up with a group perspective. Because as we know, it's easier to see biases in other people than it is in ourselves. Um, so that's one area that they learn to just um, help each other uncover their blind spots. And then as they're making decisions, um, a lot of what I teach is how to, just little tricks like um, as they're interviewing, I teach them to actively look for what's unique about this customer. So they're looking for what's new rather than falling back to, uh, I've heard this story before, you're just like the last customer I talked to, right? Um, and so that's fun for me because it's a, um, Designing ways to help teams overcome the sort of biases that we see show up in judgment and in decision making um, is a fun design problem for me, knowing that the people that I'm training aren't going to go be experts. They want to read, like even take thinking fast and slow. Most product people have that book on their list. It's not an easy book to get through. And most of them don't finish it, right? 
Um, I finished it. I love this stuff. Like I just geek out on it. And one of the roles that I love playing is being the translator. How do I make this really actionable so that it actually impacts the way that you work and you don't have to worry about the super heady academic side. You get to just focus on your customer and building better products. Cause we really, I think that's what we need. That's fantastic. And the last thing I want to just touch on, and then I'm going to bring Priyanka in to have a chat with you, is uh, you talk about discovery versus delivery and say that there's, you know, a little bit of a misbalance here, maybe in the understanding of exactly what the difference is between those or people think they're delivering. <laughs> Do you want to just elaborate on that a little bit, Teresa? Yes, yeah, so in the product world, discovery is all the work we're doing to decide what to build. And delivery is the work we're doing to actually build, ship, and maintain the product, right? So in the product world, that looks like on the discovery side, it includes things like interviewing customers, testing our assumptions, setting outcomes, so understanding what our goal is with our products. On the delivery side, it's a lot of co writing code, um, doing the design work. This distinction has become really popular in our vernacular over the last 20 years, and it's because a lot of companies started with what we call this IT mindset. So in an IT mindset, somebody in the business comes up with a random solution. I mean, it's, it's guided by a need, right? But it's not, they're not experts in technology. So they're just coming up with the best solution they can think of given their knowledge, and they're handing it off to this IT team. And, they're, and the IT team is basically order taker, an order taker. Mm -hmm. And what's wrong with that is that the people that have the least knowledge about what's possible with technology are making decisions about what to build. And then they're relying on the people with the technical skills to simply deliver it. And so this distinction is helping um, the industry recognize that actually we should let our technologists make the decision about what to build because they're the ones who have the expertise. But this distinction is not unique to the product world. So I also teach um, through the uh, School of Education and Social Policy at Northwestern University. And in that program, I teach basically organizational change agents, um, HR practitioners, and they learn to apply this exact same process to their own work. And so if we think about discovery and delivery in a broader sense, discovery is the work we're doing to decide what to do, regardless of the realm, and delivery is the work we're doing to implement that, right? So for HR practitioners, that could be our goal is we're trying to get people to, our employees to be more engaged while they're all remote. And our discovery is around what should those policies be? And then delivery is the work we're doing to actually put those policies into place. It really is a, a, a new way of thinking. And I'd say that you work with a lot of teams where there's real sort of people having <laughs> a light bulb moments and they realize, oh, hold on, you know, we need, need to tip turn the way that we've been working. But I think I've hogged you for long enough myself there, Teresa. I am going to introduce in uh, Priyanka to put a couple of questions to you and then we'll be asking our uh, members who've joined us today if they'd like to put any questions to you. So you're very welcome to join us, Priyanka. Yeah. Hi, Louise, thank you. And hello, Teresa, welcome to the club. Uh, Thank just you. to give you a basic introduction, the club has members who are PhDs, we have professors, we have people with a lot of experience, we have freshers and then people like me who are a few years in applying research and behavior science. Uh, I have so many questions to ask you, specifically with actually worked on two prod uh, product uh, research uh, briefs recently. I'll begin with the most recent one and I got to ask you about this and I'm a researcher myself. Uh, the one thing that we heard again and again when we were sitting in the briefing meeting, like what is the brief is what we were trying to clarify. And it was like, we want to see Delta. We want to see Delta. We want to see Delta change. How, what according to you should be the impact? How, how should one frame impact? Like what should the definition of impact be? Should it be Delta change or should it be something else? In terms of, um, B defining or building a product. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so a big part of what I teach is teaching teams to start with what's the outcome you're going after, which is really what's how are we measuring impact? What does success look like? And I think about that in two different ways. So a lot of teams, they over index on being customer centric. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be customer centric, we should, right? So they, they start with customer value. They look at 
What's something we can measure that indicates this was valuable to the customer? The problem with starting there is that we do see a lot of products that create value for the customer, but they don't at the same time create value for the business. Yeah. And what happens to those products? They get shut down, hmm. right? And so what I teach teams is we got to start with what's going to create value for your business. This is always derived from your business model. So we're looking at, so the exam, I always like to use Netflix as my examples because people around the world are broadly familiar with Netflix. So Netflix has a subscriber business model. They care about acquiring customers. They care about how much money you spend each month and they care about how many months you stick around. So how many months you stick around is this idea of retention, right? So that's a business metric. If we increase retention, we're gonna ensure the health of the business. We're gonna ensure that we have the right to serve our customer over time. And then I like to see teams translate that to an outcome that will serve the customer. So how, are we looking for an outcome that does measure customer value, but we believe is a leading indicator of driving that business, that business outcome? So what that looks like is, okay, why would a customer want to retain what's good for a customer? So in the Netflix case, that's probably entertain me, right? Engage me, keep me, like, help me find things that I want to watch. And so there's some measure of how many customers are staying engaged. Now with engagement, it's a little bit of a slippery slope. We engage too much. We get the backlash that we see with Facebook, right? Where Facebook created too addictive of a product. And so we want to balance that with satisfaction. So we want to engage you, but we want to make sure you stay satisfied. So how should one actually go about like finding these metrics, like engagement and satisfaction like balance it's, it's usually very top down but yeah it usually starts with your business model so if you're already working on a product that exists you're starting from your business model because mm -hmm. that's what's going to ensure that your product is viable and that you'll have the right to serve your customer over time if you're brand new like if you're a startup and you just have a problem you want to solve you don't have a product yet now there's this other work you have to do first which is really understanding the market, understanding how people are going to be willing to pay for your product and really uncovering that business model so that you can then start to look for um, what are those other outcomes that are going to be derived from that. All right. Okay. Thank you for that. So uh, the next question I do have is we recently also worked on a product uh, brief no, where I just it came in. It was something I thought you were quite the same. You were out quite a long time. You were out a long time. I ran into to what's her face? Um, is the that other one? Who hasn't unmuted? Who hasn't muted themselves? Can you all just check you're on mute, please? Thank you. Yeah. That was interesting. Off you go, Priyanka. Sorry about that. Yeah. So we recently also worked on a product brief, but like this was like pre-product research that we were doing. Mm -hmm. But the expectation was as such that it's going to be like the final guidelines. So how do you yeah. manage those expectations, and what should we focus on on a pre-product like there's an idea but on the pre-product research yeah so i think this is really a result of we have this myth we have a couple myths mm -hmm. um not just in the product world but i think around creativity and what it takes to be creative and one of them is that it's all about the idea mm -hmm. right is that we're going to wake up and have this eureka moment and have this amazing idea the other is the is the like lone genius the like creative man myth, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, none of them created their products and their companies on their, by themselves. I mean, Elon Musk is probably legitimately a bizarre genius. Um, actually, all three of them are probably outliers, but <laughs> in order for them to build their companies and their products, they had a lot more people involved than just those individuals. So because we have both of these myths, and I think they actually interact with each other and exacerbate each other, we believe that we're just going to wake up one day and have this amazing idea. And we see this a lot in startup founders, right? And so we believe the value is in the idea. That is rarely true. The idea is not even a percentage of the outcome in my view. Um, what ends up happening in practice is we end up with a pretty terrible idea. That first idea is usually pretty terrible, but mm -hmm. it's a seed. It's a seed. Like what happened was, your brain saw something that triggered this idea. And what's not visible to you is a whole bunch of inferences. You saw a problem. Your brain jumped to a solution because there was a whole bunch of hidden inferences. We don't think about examining them because we don't even know what they are. We don't even take the time to individually be aware of them, right? And we just start with the solution. And then what ends up happening is 
we start building that, we get some feedback along the way that we're wrong. Most of us are not prepared to be wrong. We don't, we ignore all that feedback. That's where confirmation bias tends to come in. We're over committed to our idea. That's where escalation of commitment tends to come in. Um, somebody's being polite and says some nice things and we believe that means it's really positive feedback and we're on the right track and we end up building the wrong thing and it's after we launch and nobody uses our product that we learn like hey we got it all wrong and i think this is really rooted in that myth that it takes one person to come up with this really creative idea and that's what leads to success and where success really comes from is we start with this usually pretty terrible idea mm -hmm. Somewhere along the line, we get feedback that suggests it's wrong and we evolve the idea. And so what we're seeing with modern product practices is we're just being deliberate about that evolution. We're saying, okay, look, let's take the time. We have this idea. Ideas are cheap. We can have a million ideas. In fact, if we want to make good decisions, we should have multiple ideas and compare and contrast and not just over fixate on our first idea. Right, so we, what we need to do is we need to recognize like, hey, we had this idea, let's slow down and look at the inferences we made to get to that idea. What inspired it? Who are we serving? What's the problem we're trying to solve? And externalize that so that we can start to examine the logic and start to look for where might we be making errors in, that, in those inferences. And even if all the logic looks sound to us, until we actually go out in the world and get feedback on those inferences and test and iterate, we have no idea if our idea is good. So I think part of it is that we just don't want to let go of this belief that it's all about the idea. <laughs> Whereas really it's all about the idea. It's all about the work to turn this mediocre idea into something that's actually going to work out. Got it. Yeah, well, I, I don't have much to add to that or say to that. Thank you for that. I do yeah. have uh, two more questions. I guess I'll ask another one and then see if we have time before uh, getting back to the chat. Uh, but uh, you speak a lot about interviews, usability tests, and diary projects to get insights. Uh, we've had like a mixed variety with respect to mixed research. So what, according to you, is the ideal sort of balance between quantitative and qualitative? And when should which kind of research come into play in this entire journey? <laughs> yeah, so there's two primary research activities that I teach teams. One is interviewing and the second is assumption testing. Mm -hmm. Assumption testing is where we're going to get into a grab bag of methods, but let's start with interviewing. Yeah. So I teach a story based format of interviewing. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of product teams, when they interview a customer, they want to ask things like, for if we stick with our Netflix example, they want to ask things like, what do you like to watch? How do you decide what to watch? Who do you watch with? What device do you watch on? The problem with all these questions is they're purely speculative. No human takes the time to sit and reflect on, how do I decide what to watch on Netflix, right? We just, we're terrible at answer, answering direct questions out of context. There's lots of research that shows this, um, especially in the criminal justice world. Uh, so what, we're, what I teach teams is to say, look, those questions are really unreliable. You're gonna build products based on people's ideal selves, not on their actual selves. Let's just ground our interviews in specific stories about the past. So instead of saying, what do you like to watch on Netflix? Just tell me about the last time you watched Netflix. And I'm going to listen for the answers to those questions. Who are you with? What did you watch? How did you decide what to watch? So that's the first thing. And our goal with interviewing is to understand our customer's context. So it's not to evaluate our ideas. It's to really understand who are we building for? What's the environment in which our product is going to live? And what are the current needs, pain points, and desires our product should address? So it's really about need finding. That's what interviewing is about. The second research activity I teach is assumption testing. And, and so interviewing is purely qualitative. And then on the assumption testing side, this is where we're going to get a mix of methods. Early on, hmm. we're not, we're early on when we, have a brand, when we have a brand new set of ideas. And I always teach teams to work with a set of ideas and to compare and contrast them against each other. Mm -hmm. We're not doing large scale quantitative tests because we simply don't have time. And I get into this a little bit in the book. So we're looking for signals of should we invest in this idea or should we throw it away? Mm -hmm. Sometimes those signals are going to be noisy, right? So we might, if we're, sometimes we're doing small scale qualitative prototype testing. Sometimes we're doing a little bit large scale, larger scale survey analysis. So we might get into quantitative testing, but most of the time in our earliest testing, we don't have um, large enough sample sizes to have representative um, samples. 
we're not really in that fully academic research realm. And the reason why this works in the product world, so we're running small to scale sampling, trying to get some feedback. It's not super reliable. It's rigorous. It's rigorous. I want to be clear there. It's rigorous because we're starting with a very specific assumption and we're asking if this assumption were true, what would we expect to see? And then we're looking for that and the opposite of that. So we are following a basic scientific method, but we're not doing truly large scale research because we don't have months or years. We have a week or two. And the reason why this works in the product world is because let's say we get a false positive. The, we talk to, we get feedback from a small sample and we get a false positive and it says this is a good idea and it's not. Mm. We don't make a build decision based on a small sample. The decision that we make is let's invest in the next experiment that will take even more time. And so we, we root out false positives in subsequent rounds of testing. Now we could get a false negative and what happens in a false negative, it means we throw an idea away that could have been successful. And the reason why this is okay is ideas are cheap. There's a billion ideas out there and it's not about finding the one best idea. It's about finding an idea that can work. Hmm. And so because false positives and false negatives are not as costly because they get rooted out over time, we can start with these small signals and then iterate our way to bigger and bigger experiments so that we're not starting with large scale experiments, spending months trying to learn something when we have to ship something next week. Got it, got it. That's incredibly uh, helpful. I have more questions based on that. One quick thing, uh, do you think discussion guides are helpful or like should scrap them for interviews? Yeah, so for a little bit of context, what a lot of product teams do is they walk into an interview and they have like this three page discussion guide of all the questions they want to ask the interviewer. Most of these questions I would argue are unreliable to ask in an interview. Um, again, with Netflix, that discussion guide is probably going to be things like, what do you like to watch? Who do you watch with? What device do you watch on? Huh. And again, humans are just not that good at asking, answering direct questions out of context. So I prefer that a team mm. separate the activities. One is brainstorm your research questions. Everything that's typically going on a discussion guide, I would call a research question. Then I want to see teams translate that into an interview question. What are one or two, maybe three story based questions we can ask that are going to elicit stories that will help you get answers to those research yeah. questions. And then instead of worrying about peppering somebody with all those questions, I want to see that person just focus on collecting the story. And usually you're going to get everything you need out of that story. Um, and so your research questions can guide how you collect that story. Um, but I see too many people fall into this pattern of, um, let me ask you a question, you give me a short answer. Let me ask you a question, let me give you a short answer. And I call that collecting facts. And I, we're not, we can't build products based on collecting facts, because first of all, they're not facts. Most of the time, the answers are going to be unreliable. And second of all, we need more context and nuance to really understand our customer's world and understand what we should be building for them. All right. Got it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, and I'm going to stop being greedy and ask all the questions. And Louise, over to you. Thanks so much, Priyanka. And I love as a market researcher that we spent the last 10 minutes talking about qual and quant approaches, where my uh, ideal self in Netflix has got a long list of documentaries I must watch, but I just end up watching Bojack Horseman. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do now is um, introduce in Jaffa. Jaffa, you had a question that you'd like to put to Teresa, please, if you're still with us. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me, Louise? We can, Jaffa. Go ahead. Thanks so much. Awesome. So I'm outside, so I'm going to quickly combine the two questions that I left in chat. So, uh, Teresa, I was curious if you have some experiences or tips in influencing uh, organizations uh, to inculcate that mindset of using a behavioral lens to look at any problems, right? be it user problem or internal uh, ways of working uh, instead of relying on gut feelings all the time uh, use more of a behavioral science framework to make informed decisions right and at the same time uh, any experience with uh, influencing the founders to look into and go deeper into the whys of the uh, problems and motivations of the user rather than always just jump to designing products and features for them, right? Because I think many org orgs do jump to it. I mean, it's the status quo way of doing things, right? We've always been doing that. But uh, we know that going forward, that's not useful. 
So uh, how can any experience in influencing founders to take that extra lens in consideration? Thank you. Yeah, so the number one question I get from people working on product teams is how do I convince my bosses to let me work this way? And my answer is actually don't. So I think if you're an individual contributor in an organization, your ability to influence up when it comes to this particular topic is not very high. And the, re is, and the reason why I say that, I'm gonna give you an alternative. Don't worry, I will give you something you can do. Uh, the reason why I say that is because everybody in an organization that's in the hierarchy above you got to where they are because what they did in the past worked for them. And so when somebody lower in the organization suggests something that's radically different from how the organization has worked, what's our reaction? Our reaction is to dig our heels in and to become even stronger advocates for our current beliefs. So that's not an effective way to influence. So what I recommend individual contributors do is instead start with the way that they think and the way that they work. So every single person in an organization can start to look at, can I increase the way that I collaborate with my peers? Can I increase my personal exposure to customers? Can I integrate some of these methods into the way that I'm making decisions and making judgments? And then what happens is as you do that, you start to get better results and other people in the organization start to get curious about how you work. And once people are curious about how you work, now you have the ability to influence. So I actually went back and got a master's in organizational change because I was really curious about this problem of how do we get organizations to change. And my takeaway is we don't. Organizations are collections of people. And the way that we get people to change is by, is by help creating experiences where they can see the gap in the way that they're working. It's not by telling them to change. It's not by trying to influence them to change. It's by creating experiences where they see the shortcomings of their current worldview and they choose to change. And so when we talk about organizational change, I believe we have to create that from the ground up. We have to create ways for all those individuals to see the gaps in their thinking and to see the errors in their ways. And so I would focus on how do we expose those gaps and how do we create positive examples or the Heath brothers in the book Decisive call it bright spots. How do we create bright spots in our own organization to open people up to there's a better way of working? I learned from a lot of years of like being the bull in the China shop of trying to get the organizations that I worked at to change. And it frankly did not work. Um, and I've seen a lot of examples where teams just start to change their own behavior. And then that starts to um, snowball and have a really big effect across the organization. That's a great insight, Teresa. I've scribbled furiously there. I really like that, the self-realization. Um, Lashazar, you had an interesting question. Are you still with us to put your question to Teresa? Lashazar's gone off to make a cup of tea. Uh, no, no, I'm curious. Can you hear me? With us? Sorry, Lashazar. Do no go problem ahead. whatsoever. No problem whatsoever. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, my name is Lachizar and uh, I'm a researcher and a PhD candidate in marketing uh, in Germany. And uh, I love uh, the talk that you have given today and uh, I can't wait to get my hands on the book for sure. Uh, as my background is uh, more in communications, but I would uh, really love to learn more about product and product marketing. So my question is related to uh, this field. And in particular, I'm also a big believer in uh, market orientation or customer centricity, if you wish. So I, I was wondering uh, for companies that have just started and that that don't have a product yet probably, or, or, or have a product or, and haven't tested the market fit, what should they do to define who is the customer and who is not the customer? Where do you draw this line? Yeah, this is a really good question. Here's one thing I'm gonna share first before I answer your question. So one of the challenges I see in the technology industry is there's a very little respect for academic research, which is really disappointing to me. I personally draw from a ton of academic research. It's really influenced my work. Um, and so for those of you, the reason why I'm suggesting this is why I'm starting with this is as a PhD candidate who wants to work in product, this is something that you should be aware of. I will share that when I wrote my book, one of my reviewers was a very big name industry expert in my field. I will not name who it was. 
And their feedback after reading my book was that I drew too much from research and that um, product people don't care about research. They care about the fact that I'm a big name in the industry and they want to know about my personal experience. I did not act on that feedback because I wanted to write an evidence-based book. That was what was important to me. I feel like um, the technology industry in particular has a lot of hubris. There's a lot that we can learn from other industries. There's a lot that we can learn from academic research. But I will share that for any of you with an academic background that wants to move into the technology industry, this is a bias that you are going to face. And so what I do to overcome that, because I want to be true to myself and stay evidence-based, I do share my sources and I do cite things, but I don't try to shove the research down people's throats. So I talk about the methods they can use to avoid biases more than I talk about the biases, right? Mm -hmm. So that's something to just to keep in mind is that there is this gulf, there is this skepticism of what do active academics know, really the people that can teach us are the people that built Amazon and Google and Facebook. Um, that, that's sort of that bias there. Okay, so how do we know, how do we figure out which customers are customers and which ones aren't? So if I'm a brand, if I'm a founder and I'm thinking about how do I start a company? Uh, most founders start with an idea. We already talked about why that's really problematic. I think the best founders have, have built awareness of, it's not about the ideas, it's about finding a customer that you wanna serve and identifying um, what value you can deliver to that customer. So in um, the industry language, it's what's your customer segment, what's the value proposition for them and finding a, a pairing of that. This literally could be as simple as, I wanna help podcasters, that's my customer segment, grow their audience. That's the value proposition. I don't know what the product is. I don't know what I'm going to build. I don't know how I'm going to do that. I don't know how that's going to work, but I've verified with my audience. I know that podcasters have this need of growing their audience and I'm passionate about helping podcasters. So I'm going to go out and do that. Okay. Now are all podcasters in my customer base or are only some right away? Not all podcasters are in my customer base because some don't have the problem of growing their audience. Some already have um, Conan O'Brien probably doesn't need help growing his podcast audience, right? He probably has millions of people already that listen to him. So that's one filter. As I go and interview podcasters and learn about what are their needs, what are their pain points, what are their desires around growing their podcast audience, I'm going to start to learn about who has this need the most, what are the friction points, what are the ones that I'm most likely able to address, and that's going to further segment who can I serve who am I not going to serve? And that's where product strategy starts to emerge. We see lots of examples. Google and Apple are good examples of this. They both play in the mobile space. They serve very different customers. Somebody who's going to buy an Android phone is very different from somebody who's going to buy an iOS phone. And we see that very deliberately in those companies choosing who they're going to serve. People that choose um, Google tend to care a lot more about open systems. People that care that choose Apple tend to want the user experience of closed systems. There's lots of other differences between those two companies. Um, but as you understand your customer base, you'll start to make decisions that will influence who's going to fall into your customer base and who's not. But it really starts with understanding um, what are the needs, pain points, and desires that, those, that that segment is currently facing. Thank you very much for sharing, uh, uh, first of all, your uh, take on on the industry and your experience with it. And uh, uh, quick follow up uh, with regard to, uh, to the question, how narrow should you go? What's what you would say? Yeah, this is a great question. Far narrower than you think. So people Sorry. tend to believe that like Google started by trying to serve everybody or LinkedIn started by trying to serve everybody or Facebook started by trying to serve everybody. Facebook is a phenomenal example. Facebook started on Harvard's campus for Harvard students. That's a very teeny tiny niche. From there, they expanded to other, uh, I believe they started with other Ivy Leagues. And then they started expanding to other um, top ranked schools. And then they started expanding to all schools. It took them several years before they opened up to anybody. For their first several years, you had to have a .edu email address to join the platform. Um, the reason why I would start much sm uh, smaller niche, more narrow than you think, is that to get somebody to actually use your product, you have to serve their needs far and away better than any existing solution. 
And so the narrower you start, the more likely you're going to be able to do that. And then once you serve that audience, you can expand to adjacent markets. Um, so I like, I really prefer that companies start with a teeny tiny market, over serve them, over deliver for them. That's what's going to get you word of mouth. It's going to get you revenue. It's going to give you um, stability to then continue to serve other markets. Perfect. Thanks so much. Yeah. I'm, I'm delighted that Lash has uh, brought that question up, Teresa, because uh, Divya had to leave the uh, group, but she had asked that I put her question to you, which expands on this theme, where she asks, how do, how do you get an organization to steer the product in a more narrow audience? She says from spraying all over, and I don't know this term, but Arvind has told me that internally they call this the spray and pray approach. So yeah. how exactly, we're talking about narrowing, but if we've already gone wide, how do we encourage an organization to go narrow again? Yeah, so there's competing interests here, right? If we, this is, we see this a lot in the product world. There's the sales mindset and then there's the product mindset. So what's the sales mindset? A salesperson is motivated and incentivized to close every customer they talk to, regardless of whether they're a good fit. They think about it as there's revenue at risk here. And my job is to capture that revenue, right? And so it's a very individual opportunity perspective. Grab as many opportunities as possible one at a time. A product perspective is very different. It's a market perspective. It's how do we serve as much of the market as possible? And really it's how do we build as little as possible to serve as much of the market as possible? Because that's what's gonna allow us to capture more of the market as quickly as possible, right? And there's huge benefits to winning a market or being a dominant leader in a market. Unfortunately, those two things are often at odds because we often hear from, and this is the hardest situation, really big name, big potential revenue customers that are unlike everybody else in the market. And so we find businesses are in situations where they're either choosing between a large revenue customer where they're building a whole bunch of custom stuff that isn't gonna help them win the market or turning that revenue away and focusing on serving the market. Is there a right answer? It really depends on your organizational context. If you're a bootstrap startup, and you don't take that large revenue customer, you're, ne you're not gonna have the runway to actually serve the market over time. So you might make that short-term decision to build some irrelevant stuff to bring in some revenue so that you have runway to then serve the market. If you're a really mature company and you have plenty of revenue, the, I would argue you should focus on serving more of the market and not that single revenue customer. But very few humans have the ability to say no when there's a big price ticket on an opportunity. Right, so this is a tension. I personally think it's a healthy tension because companies do need to look at short-term revenue. That's what pays our paychecks. So it keeps the lights on. And we need to look at the long view and make sure that we're building a business that's viable over time and that we're serving a market over time. And I think that tension is always gonna be there. And I actually think it's really good because we need to find a way to do both. We see, especially in public markets, an over-index towards short-term because we're looking at delivering short-term earning reports. Um, and we see some companies, they tend to be really well-funded companies by prior successful entrepreneurs over index on the other end where they're thinking way too long-term and they blow a ton of money and they never bring in short-term revenue. Whereas I think really it's a lot of the work is how do we balance the two? And there's so many factors that are gonna determine which one's right. That's fantastic, Teresa. We're coming very close to the end of the session. Um, now, Aoshi has put a very interesting question in the chat, which I'd love to get covered before we wrap up. Um, are you still, oh yes, you're still with us, Aoshi, about the uh, product analytics tools. Would you like to put your question to Teresa? Thanks, Louise. Um, hi, Teresa. So I'm actually working with this startup, which is supposedly lean startup, and they are planning to include or integrate a product analytics tool like a mixed panel um, onto the product. And they're talking about, you know, behavioral cues that you could, you know, kind of um, have, which informs the entire product development. What do you, what is your take about these product analytics tools that are currently out there in the market? Yeah, so what's great in the product world, this is part of why I said, we don't have to do this like seeking knowledge, seeking truth level of research because we have really good feedback loops. And one of those really good feedback loops are these analytical tools. 
we can put up we can put something out in the world and immediately see how people use it how they engage with it what they're doing and that's a that a, that's what a, that's what drives our iteration so those tools are what unlocks a lot of our discovery methods teams make a lot of mistakes when they implement those tools um, there's a really common pattern of we're going to measure everything and then what happens is teams get lost in the data right there's a lot of noise and very little signal and so to really implement one of those analytics tools well you have to start with and again it, for most companies it usually starts with your business model how are we creating value for the business we're we're um, pulling the levers and turning the knobs of our business model. How are we doing that in a way that creates value for the customer? So making sure that we're customer centric. Um, and then what does that mean we should measure? What's, where do we find meaning in the sea of data? And really setting up dashboards and analytics to support those meaningful decisions and not just measuring everything. So one of the things I use, one of the phrases I use a lot with my teams is, what are the metrics that are actionable, not just interesting? There's lots of interesting data out there. There's very little actionable data out there. Um, and so I think the key is being really deliberate about what's creating value for the business, what's creating value for the customer. Measuring more is not necessarily better. Measuring the right things that are actionable, that are gonna support good decision-making are what we're looking for. I do have a chapter about that in my book, by the way, if you wanna dive in and learn more. I do introduce a metrics framework to help you think about the different types of metrics. And then I get into um, how do you track enough to measure your, to evaluate your assumptions? And then how do you measure even more to make sure that you're creating both customer value and business value? Thanks so much. Thank you for those great questions. Thank you, Teresa, an absolute font of knowledge with the most amazing sound bites. I feel like we'd all like a sort of a Teresa to sit on our shoulders <laughs> whenever we have to go into any client meeting because you seem to have the absolute perfect answer to every single challenging question that gets oh, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, it's just been absolutely fantastic to listen to everything that you've had to say, Teresa. And I'm sure that um, everybody has taken away at least one uh, actionable thing that they think they can bring with them to improve the way they work. Um, just been fascinating listening to you and uh, really grateful for you joining us today. Um, as several people mentioned, Teresa's super book, Continuous Discovery Habits, if you think that there are things that Teresa has spoken about today that you'd like to read more about, it's a super book. And um, I'd just like to thank all of you for joining us again, all of the regular members who it's so great to see. I'd like to thank Priyanka for co-hosting with me today in the absence of Prakash. She's done a sound job. Thank you, Priyanka. And we hope that we will see you all next week. Lovely to see you and see you next week. See you now. Bye. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Bye. For those who remain, thank you for messaging, for showing interest in the cross-cultural project. And anyone interested on the internal projects we are running at the Behavior Science Club, feel free to reach out to me. Thanks, Priyanka. And thank you so much. I hope you've enjoyed sharing the group with me today. I'm going to yeah, jump off you. now because my kids have come over to visit. So thanks, all of you. And we'll Bye. see you next week. Have a good week now.